class, welcome to episode uh, nine on polynomial functions in our Math 1050 College Algebra class. I'm Dennis Allison and I teach mathematics here at Utah Valley State College. Uh, we're starting some new material today for the second exam and uh, basically in this interval of several episodes, we'll be talking about graphs of higher degree polynomial functions and also rational functions and a number of ideas that would be, that would be related to that. Uh, today, I'd like to begin with a number of objectives. First of all, we want to look at the fundamental polynomial gra or graphs of fundamental polynomial functions. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, the connection between zeros, roots, and x-intercepts of a function. Uh, then we're going to look at how we can approximate the extrema of polynomial functions, sometimes using a graphing calculator. So you'll want to use your graphing calculator today to follow along. And then we'll finish up by looking at a few applications of polynomial functions to real world problems. Now, uh, to begin with, you remember um, in a previous episode, we looked at about eight fundamental functions. There was, the, there was the absolute value function, there was the squaring function, there was the greatest integer function. Uh, well, I want to add a few uh, more functions to that list. And let's begin with f of x equals x cubed. Now, um, we've Oh, let's see, actually, I'm going to begin with f of x equals x to the fourth. We've graphed f of x equals x cubed before. Uh, now, if I want to graph x to the fourth, what I would do would be to plot three target points, and they're rather familiar target points that we've seen in other graphs. Uh, there's the target point um, at 0, 0. There's a target point at 1, 1, and there's a target point at negative 1, 1. We've seen those same target points for f of x equals x squared. We saw those for the absolute value function. It's just a matter of knowing what curve to draw uh, when, you, when you graph these. Now, the function f of x equals x to the fourth comes in steeper than the quadratic function. So it comes in, I'll draw it a little bit steeper than I would a parabola. And then it flattens out a little faster uh, along the, along the x-axis. It doesn't actually touch the x-axis until it gets to the origin. But then it turns and it goes back up, and it goes to the point negative 1, 1, and it leaves going back up again. Uh, you notice this function is an even function. We talked about even functions several episodes back. It's an even function because it has an even power there, and its graph would be symmetric about the y-axis. So if it goes up on the right, it also goes up on the left. Uh, if I were to compare it with the quadratic function, uh, I'll write it just below here, f of x equals x squared. There are the same target points, but the difference is the quadratic function comes in not as steeply. Uh, it turns, and it doesn't level off quite as fast. So here, the quadratic function would be above the fourth power function. And then it turns, and it goes back up. And it also is an even function, so it, it goes back out just as it did before. So these two graphs cross at only the three target points and no others. If I graph any other even power uh, of x, I would get a similar graph. So uh, suppose, for example, I wanted to graph the function f of x equals x to the tenth. Now, this is another even function, but it has the same target points at 0, 0, 1, 1, and at negative 1, 1. But, uh, but the difference is this one would appear to come in almost vertically. It isn't exactly vertical, but it comes in very steeply. It flattens out very fast along here. It turns and it goes back up almost vertically again. There, there's a slight curve to that, but it, it would be difficult for me to actually show that, that curve to you. And this would be the graph of f. Uh, just to show you how, how rapidly it goes up, suppose I come over here to 2. If I found the function value at 2, f of 2 would be 2 to the 10th power. And 2 to the 10th power is over 1,000. It's 1,024. So at 2, I'd have to go up over 1,000 to get onto the graph. That's how rapidly it's gone up. Same thing at negative 2. f of negative 2 is um, 1,024 also. So if I go to negative 2, I have to go up over 1,000 to get on the graph. On the other hand, if I were to choose 1 half right here, uh, f at 1 half that would be 1 half to the 10th power, which is 1 over 2 to the 10th. And we said that 2 to the 10th was over 1,000, so this is 1 over 
1024. So it's so close to the x-axis, we really couldn't tell the difference between the x-axis and the point that's on the graph there. So it makes this very, very abrupt change from being almost horizontal to being almost vertical over there. Of course, if I put in even larger, even powers, I get even steeper graphs and even flatter graphs in the middle. Um, okay, now, if I put an odd power on the polynomial, let's say we want to graph uh, f of x equals x to the fifth. Its behavior is very much like f of x equals x cubed and f of x equals x. Uh, the target points would be, um, let's see, if I substitute in a zero, I get zero for the function value. If I substitute in one, I get one. And if I substitute in negative one, I get negative one. We've seen these target points, like we said, on the cubic function and on the identity function, f of x equals x. Uh, but the difference is, because this power is bigger than the cubic function, it comes in steeper than the cubic function and it flattens out a little faster than the cubic function would do, and then it turns and it goes down. Uh, you notice that this is an odd function because of the odd power on the x, and it has symmetry about the origin. And what that meant was if you pick a point, for example, this target point on the graph, if you go through the origin, there is another point just like it on the same distance on the other side of the origin over here. So every point has a, shall we say, sort of a twin uh, on the other side of the origin, same distance away. And if I were to increase this power from uh, x to the fifth to x to the seventh, x to the ninth, x to the eleventh, I just get steeper graphs, flatter graphs, steeper on, on the way out. <coughs> Uh, now, it, it would be difficult for us to, by hand, to draw variations in that steepness, so I'm not looking for you to, to, uh, to be too precise on this, but I want you to be aware of these, of these relationships. Now, on, on the odd function, you notice that one end goes up, one end goes down. That's what we will refer to as the end behavior of the graph. On this end, the graph is going up, and on this end, the graph is going down. The end behavior on an even-powered function is that if it's only x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth, the end behavior is that both sides go up. So if I refer to the end behavior, I'm just saying what happens as you go further out on either end of the graph. Um, odd functions go up on one side, down on the other. Even functions uh, exit the same way they came in. If they came in from up above, they'll go back out up above. Okay. Um, now, what if I make a, uh, make a transformation of a fundamental polynomial function like this? Suppose we have f of x equals um, x minus 2 to the fourth power plus 1. Well, we've seen this same information for other fundamental functions. When I subtract 2 from directly on the x, that means move the graph 2 units to the right. And when I add a 1 on the outside of the function, that means move the graph straight up one unit. So when I graph it, I'm going to shift my origin over two units, and I'm going to go up one unit, so my new origin is right here at the point 2, 1. And my target points would be to go over one and up one, and go to the left one and up one. And now I'll draw my basic fourth degree polynomial uh, function so that it turns and it goes up rather steeply here. And on the other side, it turns, it goes up rather steeply, rather steeply over here. This will eventually cross the y-axis, but it'll cross the y-axis fairly high up. And over here, this, uh, on the right-hand side, the graph goes up and it never comes back down again. So this is a uh, transformation of my original function, f of x equals x to the fourth. Uh, you know, while we're at it, well, let's just try calculating the y-intercept. Uh, to find the y-intercept, uh, who can remind me, what, what do we do to find the y-intercept of a graph, uh, Matt? Just set x equal to zero. Set x equal to zero. So if I substitute in zero for x, I'll get the y-intercept, because that'll tell me where, where the, will be an ordered pair where x is zero. Well, if I substitute in a zero, that's negative two to the fourth plus one. And that says my answer is going to be positive because that's a negative to the fourth power. Two to the fourth is 16 plus one. So I get 17. So that says I'd have to go up to 17 on my graph before my curve would actually be crossing the, uh, the y-axis. And 
just for the purpose of kind of reviewing this idea, how would I find the x-intercepts? And you might say, no, wait a minute, Dennis, there aren't any x-intercepts. Look, it doesn't cross the x-axis. Let's see if we can verify that algebraically. Uh, to find the x-intercepts, what do we do, Jeff? Set the equation equal to zero. Yeah. Uh, to find the x-intercepts, let me just write this down here. To find the x-intercepts, I'll, I'll put the s in parentheses because sometimes there's only one. In, in this case, it doesn't look like there really be any. Uh, what we do is we let y be zero. And if I put a zero in for y, or f of x, then what we're doing is setting the equation, or setting the expression, uh, equal to zero. And so this says that x minus 2 to the fourth power is negative 1. And here we have our contradiction. We have a real number raised to the fourth power. It can't be negative 1. This is impossible, which means the original expression couldn't be 0, which means there are no x-intercepts. And that's exactly what our, what our graph had indicated to us. There are no x-intercepts. For this, for this graph. So what I see visually in the graph, I can support with algebraic computation, and vice versa. Sometimes we get information algebraically, and we can support it by drawing a graph. I'd like to take the graph of another fundamental function that's been transformed, you might say. Um, this time, I'm going to call it uh, little g of t equals 2 times, um, let's make it a negative 2 times, uh, t plus 1 to the 11th power minus 3. Well, if I were to multiply this out, this would look like a very long polynomial. There'd be an 11th power, a 10th power, a 9th power, all the way down to the constant term. But it's easier to graph if I leave it in this form. Because you see, this is a variation of, over here I'm sort of thinking of a variation, it's a variation of the function g of t equals t to the 11th power. This is an odd function. Uh, rather, it's an odd power uh, on t, and that makes it an odd function. So I know the target points, and I know that it exits uh, going up on the right, and it exits going down on the left. So what changes will I make in my fundamental graph to graph this one? What, what changes will I want to make in this? You're going to go to the left one and down three. OK, go to the left one and go down three. What about the negative two? Well, see, now it's on the outside. Uh, Matt, what do you think? Well, it's going to be uh, shifted upside down. OK, it's going to be inverted. And it will be uh, stretched by a factor of two. Exactly, it's going to be stretched two. So I'll just make that longer to indicate not only are we going to flip it over, we're going to stretch the graph. OK, so if you kind of get my little code there, Let's see if we can draw that graph now. So here are my coordinate axes. I'll have to call this the t-axis because I made this a variable t. Um, and if I scale this off a little bit, uh, let's see, we said we're going to go to the left one and down three. OK, that puts my new origin at the point negative 1, negative 3. I'll just indicate that over here, negative 1, negative 3. And uh, let's see, now normally I would go over 1 and up 1, and I would go to the left 1 and down 1, but we have this inversion and stretch. So when I go over 1, I'm going to go down 2, and I get a target point right here. That's going to be at actually negative 5. And when I go to the left 1, I'm going to go up 2, because I have, uh, I have flipped this graph over. I've made a, a reflection out of it. And now I think I'm ready to sketch the graph. I know that because I flipped it over, this graph is going to be exiting going down. And it's an 11th power, so it's going to look almost flat. And then it'll make a very abrupt turn, and it'll go down very quickly. I'm sort of running out of room there for you to see that. On the other side, it's not exactly horizontal, but it, it, it's hard to tell the difference. It's just, it's just turning up, and then all of a sudden it goes up very quickly and it crosses the x-axis just to the left of uh, negative 2, and it goes up looking almost vertical. It isn't exactly vertical. Functions can't have vertical aspects, vertical portions in the graph. But uh, this is a rough sketch of the function g. Now, you see, what's important here is we are now sketching some rather complicated looking functions. We're talking about an 11th degree polynomial, the 11th power 
of t plus 1 with a few other changes made to it. And we're coming up with a rough sketch of the graph by plotting only, what, three points. We plotted three points is all. And we don't have a totally accurate graph, but we have a rough sketch. It, it's good enough for the applications that we're going to be looking at uh, later in, the, in this course. Okay, um, <clears throat> now I'm, this time I'm going to take one more function and ask several, several questions about it. Suppose I want to graph, um, let's take uh, f of x equals, um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm going to take uh, x minus 1 to the fifth power plus plus 3, plus 3. And this one is graphed in a manner very similar to the ones that we've just looked at. Uh, but I'm going to ask an additional question this time that I haven't asked about the others. This will be the x-axis because my independent variable is x, and this will be the y-axis. Now, it looks like the changes we're going to make is we're going to move this graph to the right one, and we're going to move it up 3, so let's do that. I'm going to move it to the right one, and I'm going to move it up 3. So right one, up 3, that puts my new origin right here. And my target points, let's see, there's, there's no stretch, there's no reflection, so I just go over one and up one. And uh, let's see now, when I go to the left, sh should I go over and up one or should I go over and down one? Over and down. Yeah. Over and down because this is an odd function. So I'm going to go over and down one right here. And so I come up with a graph that looks like um, roughly like this. Now, just by looking at that graph, what is its y-intercept? Two. Yeah, looks like it's at uh, y equals two. I'll make it an ordered pair and call it zero, two. But this time, I want to find the x-intercept. And so what I'll do is substitute in zero for f of x to find the x-intercept. I think maybe I can do that over here on this side to find the x-intercept. What I'll do is let y equal 0, and that says 0 is equal to x minus 1 to the fifth power plus 3. Now, we can see in the graph that there is an x-intercept, and we can see that it's a negative number, but it's very close to 0. So that's what we expect to get here when we solve for x. So if I put negative 3 on the other side, if I subtract 3 from both sides, uh, then we have x minus 1 to the fifth power is negative 3. Now, I'll need to take a fifth root. This looks kind of messy. I'm going to take a fifth root of negative 3, you can take an odd root of a negative number, and that will be x minus 1. And there is a fifth power in here that I can factor out, because this negative 1 times 3, this negative 1 is the same thing as negative 1 to the fifth power. So its fifth root is a negative 1, which I'll bring out. And then if I solve for x, I think I'll put the x on the uh, left-hand side, if I solve for x, I need to subtract 1 from both sides. That's going to be minus the fifth root of 3 minus, um, minus 1. Minus the fifth root of 3 minus 1. Um, oh, let's see. It looks like I copied something wrong there. That should be a minus. And so this should be a plus. Yeah, that was my, that was my copying error. Now, it turns out that the fifth root of 3 is slightly larger than 1. So the negative fifth root of 3 is slightly smaller than negative 1. And when you add 1 to it, you come up with a number that's just barely negative right there. You get this number right here. But it isn't, it isn't a fraction. It isn't a nice rational number. It's certainly not an integer. But it's, a, it's an irrational number calculated uh, to be this. OK, now uh, the, the number that I found here called the x-intercept, this goes by several other names. An x-intercept is also called. Uh, a zero or a root. And these words are used interchangeably, but normally in uh, the context of uh, other functions. So let's go to this uh, first graphic that we have that we can call up here. And I put several pieces of information on this. So let's, let's just look at the first statement. It says, any function of the form, uh, a constant a sub n times x to the n plus a constant a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1. And you notice the powers on x just keep going down until I get a sub 1 x plus a constant a sub 0. Any function that can be written in that form is called a polynomial function. For example, x cubed 
plus 2x squared minus 3x minus 5. That would be called a polynomial function because I have, uh, I have a, basically a polynomial as the rule. And you notice that in that statement, I'm naming the function capital P of x, probably P for polynomial as opposed to F for function. So a lot of the problems in the book, they'll name the functions by P of x. Now in the second part, it says that if P at a number C is 0, then C is sometimes referred to as a root or a zero of the polynomial, a root or a zero, because you see C makes the polynomial equal uh, zero, so it's called a zero for the polynomial. Also, C is an x-intercept of the graph of the polynomial function y equals uh, p of x. And finally, x minus C is a factor of the polynomial p of x. Now, let me just show you an example of what that last part there refers to. Suppose I were to take the polynomial function uh, p of x equals um, x plus 2 times uh, x, minus, x minus 1. Now, if I multiply that out, this is a quadratic function. But actually, I want to graph it in this form and see what I can learn about this quadratic function. The graph is going to be a parabola. But uh, there are two numbers that I could substitute in for x. There's a number I could plug in for x that would make this 0, and there's another number I could plug in for x that would make this 0. It looks like if I substitute in a negative 2, this factor is 0, and I get 0 times negative 3 is 0. On the other hand, I could substitute in the number 1, and I would get 3 times 0 is 0. So I have two numbers that I could choose for x, that would make this polynomial be zero, this polynomial function be zero. So I would say that x equals negative two and x equals one are zeros of the polynomial function or of the polynomial p of x because these are the numbers that will make the function value be zero. On the other hand, I would say that x equals negative two and x equals 1 are x-intercepts of the graph of p of x. So now I know two x-intercepts. On the other hand, uh, x minus negative 2, that would be x plus 2, and x minus 1, those are factors of the polynomial p of x, the polynomial expression p of x. Well, let's just take that last part. Certainly those are both factors because if you look at the way we wrote this in the beginning, x plus 2 and x minus 1, those are factors of the polynomial. Um, on the other hand, uh, both of these numbers are x-intercepts because if I were to set this function equal to 0 and solve for x, I would come up with x is negative 2, or x equals 1, and those would be the two x-intercepts that I would get. And then, finally, I'm using a word zeros. These numbers are both called zeros of the polynomial, and another word that's sometimes used here is they're called roots, roots of the polynomial. Now, if I want to draw the graph of this function, with this information, here's what I could do. I could just locate its x-intercepts. And uh, one of the x-intercepts is at uh, negative 2. And one of the x-intercepts is at 1. There's 1, there's negative 2. And <clears throat> if I were to multiply my polynomial out now, I'm going to go back up here and multiply those two together. I get x squared uh, plus 2x minus x, so plus x minus 2. There, here's, my, here's, the, here's the rule for the polynomial when it's written as a quadratic, and I recognize this as being a parabola, or the graph would be a parabola, so it's going to come down, it's going to go through this point, it's going to turn, and it's going to go back up. The one thing I don't have is the vertex. So I know that the graph comes down like this, and the graph comes down like this. The one thing I'm missing is the vertex, but you know, we actually have a rule for finding the vertex. And if you remember that rule was x equals negative b over 2a. We had that just a few episodes back. And so in this case, x would be negative b, that's negative 1, over 2a. 2 times 1 is 2, so we get negative a half. 
and the y and the y coordinate of the vertex would be p evaluated at negative one half. Now let's see, that would be one fourth minus one half minus two. One fourth minus one half minus two. And I think if you total that up, you get negative two and one fourth. So if I go to negative one half, let's see, that was negative one right there. If I go to negative one half, and if I go down to negative two and a fourth, that would put me right about here. I would say that's the vertex. And so my graph turns and it goes up like this. And it turns and it goes up like this. I'm, I'm going to kind of even that out a little bit right there. This is the graph of P. <clears throat> now the whole purpose of this example is to show you that I can begin to graph a polynomial function by locating its x-intercepts. And because it's a quadratic function, I can actually do more. I could find the vertex afterwards, and I could lo locate the vertex, and uh, then I could complete my graph. Now, when it come to polynomials of higher degree than a quadratic, this is called a second degree polynomial, but when I get a third or a fourth or a fifth degree polynomial, uh, I don't have formulas that'll tell me where the vertex is. So what I'll do is only locate the intercepts, and on that basis, I'll sketch the graph. Let's take an example of that. <coughs> Uh, let's skip to the, um, the, the second graphic coming up here. Yeah, um, let's see. Now, I have two examples here that uh, I think we've already talked about these. Let, let me sketch these ex two examples before we go to the, to the next one. Uh, the first graphic there says f of x equals x plus 2 cubed minus 3, and I want to graph that function. Uh, let's see, and I would like to be able to draw on the screen. So there we go. Okay, so I want to draw this function directly below, directly below the statement of the, of the function there. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. And uh, what are the changes I would want to make in that graph? Uh, to the left, two, and down three. To the left, two, yep, and got to go down three, okay. So to the left, two, down three, I get my new origin right here. And uh, this is a cubic function, so I know that I should go over and up one. I should go back and down one. And so my graph is going to look something like this. Um, it's going to come down, it's going to level off there, and it's going to go down. I don't know that I have the proper y-intercept there. I'm just kind of sketching, making a rough sketch of the graph. So this is the graph of that function, capital F. And when I go to the other graph, this has the same shifts, but it's a fourth degree curve. I'll have to call this the t-axis. So I'm going to go to the left two and down three. But because this is a fourth degree function, I'm going to go over one and up one, and I'm going to go to the left one and up one. And now I'll draw a fourth degree function, which should be slightly steeper than that one. So I'm going to have it coming in a little bit steeper, turns a little bit flatter, and its in, beha in behavior would have it going back up over on the other side, and that's the graph of that function. Okay, now let's go to the graphic after this one. Okay, in this next example, we have a function that is defined by the product of three linear factors, x plus 3, x minus 1, and x minus 2. So let's see how we'd go about graphing this. Um, you know, if I were to multiply this out, this would be a cubic function, but it wouldn't be a simple power of a binomial, a cubic power of a binomial, but it's three different binomial factors. Uh, and so it would have a cubic, a, a quadratic, or a square term, a first power term, and a constant term. And uh, I wouldn't be able to graph it in that form, but I can graph it in this form. Here's how I'll do it. Uh, you see, uh, there, there are three zeros for this function. Uh, remember, those are the numbers that would make the function be zero. If I substitute in a negative three, this factor's zero, and so the whole thing will be zero. So one of the zeros is at negative three. Uh, what would be the zero for this factor? One. One, okay. And uh, what would be the zero for the last factor? Two. That would be two. Okay. Now you remember, another name for a zero is a root. So these are also the roots. But also, it tells me these are the x-intercepts. Well, now that's the word that I want to be able to draw this, this graph. 
we now have three x-intercepts at negative three, at one, and at two. So with that information, I think we can sketch a graph that's relatively accurate, and we can certainly draw it very quickly. Here's how. I'm going to put my axes over here. And uh, one, two, three, let's say that's four. And negative one, negative two, negative three, there's negative four. I'm not going to bother labeling the y-axis because I don't really know how high or low this function will go. I'm just going to get the general shape. And I'm thinking that I have an x-intercept at negative 3, and I have an x-intercept at 1, and an x-intercept at, at 2. And uh, so looking back at the original polynomial function, if I were to multiply this out up here, I would be multiplying x times x times x. The very first term is going to be x cubed. Let me just write that out right here in that, in that space. So my function p of x is going to begin with an x cubed, and then there will be some more terms after that. But the other terms are relatively insignificant for my purposes at the moment. But you see, this is a positive x cubed. And if that first term has a positive coefficient, it means the graph on the right-hand side is going to go up. And so from this point, my graph is going to be going up like this. Or if I look at it the reverse order, it's going to be coming down to this x-intercept. It's going to go through this point, through this intercept. It's going to turn, and it's going to come back to this x-intercept. And it's going to go up. But this time, I'm going to draw it up quite a bit higher because we don't have to come back down to the x-axis until we get all the way over here. So I have room to go up before I have to come back down. It's like I have an appointment. I have to be here at negative 3. And then my graph keeps going down. So this is my very rough sketch of the polynomial function that we were given in this example. Now, there's quite a bit to talk about here. Number one, when I draw my graph coming through this point, how far down should I go before I go back up? You see, other people might draw it much further down before they go back up. Well, it, for, for our purposes, it's relatively insignificant how far down you draw it. All I know is it goes down and it goes back up, and this is the general shape. It may actually go much lower than what I've actually shown here, but uh, without plotting more points, this is the best we can do, and we're, we're trying to do this in a hurry. Now, the reason I went up higher here than I went down here is because I had a span of only one interval, and here I have a span of four in that interval. So there's more time for it to go up, wander up, before it comes back down. And it may actually be that this function should go up much higher than I've actually drawn it, but relatively speaking, I'm making that one go higher than I did this one to go lower over here. And then I come back and I go back through this intercept on the way out. Okay, another question you might be asking is, Dennis, how did you know the function went up as opposed to going down just because that cubic term had a positive coefficient? Well, you see what happens if I go from, let's see, this is 2 right here. If I go over to 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., this term is going to dominate all the other terms that I see in this expansion. There will be a second degree term, a first degree term, and a constant term, but uh, if if, this, uh, if the cubic term is positive, then when I start cubing numbers like 3, 4, 5, and 6, that's going to become extremely, shall we say, extremely positive, and it's going to cancel out any, any effects these other guys could have. Even if they're negative, this one's going to take over, because it's the biggest power. And it wants to be positive, so I know that my graph eventually has to be positive up there. Uh, same thing over on this side. I have the graph going down on the left. Now, why is that? Well, you see, in general, when I go beyond negative 3, this is negative 3 right here. If I go to negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, what happens when you cube a negative number? It becomes very negative. It, it, it's going to become more and more negative, and it's going to dominate the square, the first power, and the linear term. This one's going to take over, and this one says it wants to be negative. The other terms can't stop it. It's going to go negative, so it's going to go down over here. And this is the general characteristic of any third degree polynomial function like this one. Uh, it goes up on one side, it goes down on the other. Now, if there had been a negative in front of that, I would have flipped this all over, and it would have been going down on the right, and it would have gone up on the left. But still, my n behavior would be that they do opposite things on opposite sides, because this is an odd power function. If the highest power had been a fourth power, they would either both go up, or they'd both go down. That would be the end behavior that I would see. 
You know, still another question that a person might ask is, Dennis, you said this function went up, but could it have done something like this? Could it have gone up and gone back down and then gone up like you said it was going to do? This would be impossible in this function because look, it would create two more x-intercepts. And I don't have any more x-intercepts because we've identified all the roots. You remember back here we had negative three, plus one, and plus two. Those are the only x-intercepts, so my graph can't turn and go back below the x-axis on the way up. And yet another point that a person might, might uh, question about this is you might say, well, Dennis, could it turn up here and then go up? Is that possible? So that you don't have any x-intercepts, but maybe there's a little bit of an aberration in there. And the answer to this is yes, this is actually possible for some functions, but for the ones that we consider that are, shall we say, relatively simple, it's just three linear factors multiplied together, we generally don't get a lot of other uh, fancy curves and reverses in our graphs. So um, without further explanation, I'll just say this is how the graph looks. Let's go to the next example, and I think we see, uh, we see further information, uh, the next graphic has further information about polynomial functions. Uh, this refers to what's called the multiplicity of a root or a zero. Now, if a factor appears only once, then we say that its multiplicity is one and the graph crosses the x-axis at that x-intercept. If a factor appears squared, or let's say to a fourth power, if the multiplicity is, uh, is even, in this case I said if the multiplicity is two, what happens is the graph turns and it goes back from the x-axis. It doesn't actually cross the x-axis, but it turns sort of like a parabola and it goes back. I'll show you an example of this in a moment. <clears throat> and finally, if the multiplicity is three or any other odd number bigger than three, what happens is the graph levels off at the x-intercept and then it proceeds to cross the x-axis. Okay, let's do another example just like the one that I, I just did. I think I'll call this function q of x because we call the last one p of x. And uh, this time, I'm going to put a coefficient of 2 in front, and then x minus 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 1. Okay, several things I'd like to point out here. You notice each factor is given to the first power. x minus 3, that's not squared, that's just a first power. x plus 2 is to the first power, and x minus 1 is to the first power. There's a word for this, that's referred to the multiplicity of the factor. You remember there was a movie a few years ago called Multiplicity. Uh, let's see, what was the name of the guy who started that, uh, Keaton? Uh, Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton, yeah, he was in a movie called Multiplicity. Well, this is called multi Multiplicity. And uh, so I would say that the multiplicity for each factor is one because there's a first power there, first power there, first power there. I have only one of each one of those factors. Now you might say, well, what about the two in front? Well, this is a coefficient. That's not a multiplicity. That's going to cause a stretch. So it means that relatively speaking, my graph will be a little steeper than I would have drawn it otherwise. Okay, so the multiplicity of each factor is one in this example, and that was the case in the last example as well. So what I'd like to figure out are what are the x-intercepts? Well, the x-intercepts are the same thing as the zeros are the roots. And I think I have three x-intercepts. Um, can anyone tell me what the three x-intercepts are? Three, negative two, and one. Three, negative two, and one. Exactly. So I'm going to use those to draw the graph. So when I put the graph right here, uh, I'll locate, uh, here's three. I'll put a dot on that one. And then here's negative two. I'll put a dot on that one. And then I'll put a dot right here. So I've got uh, three, negative two, and one. You notice I'm not going to bother marking off a scale on the y-axis because I don't really know how high this graph is going to go, how low it's going to go. I'm just trying to get a rough sketch. So I don't want to, I don't want to presume to know that I'm going to, I'm going to be able to tell you how high they'll be. Uh, now, if I were to multiply this out up here, uh, I think I could just squeeze in the very first term. I would get x times x times x times 2. That's going to be 2x cubed. And then there will be some other terms after that. But what's important is that my lead term, my lead coefficient is a positive number, 2x cubed. If it's positive, that tells me the graph goes up on the right. So I know that from this point, my graph goes up on the right. So I'll just, that's probably a little bit too steep. I'll have it go like that. 
and uh, it's going to come through this point. It's going to go down, I don't know how far, it's going to come back to negative to positive one, and it's going to go through that point, it's going to go up, but you know it's going to go a little bit higher now than it did going down here. Can anyone explain why? Why that goes higher there than it goes down here? It has to do with the span. You notice there's only a two unit span there. There's a three unit span here. So I have more time to go away before I come back. So it wanders off a little bit further. But it does eventually come back here and the graph goes, should be kind of turning down right there. And this is a very crude sketch of Q. I don't know that this is actually how far down the graph would go. I don't know that's actually how, f how high up the graph would go. It's just a, a rough sketch. What I do know is these three points are accurate. And I know that the end behavior, the end behavior here and here is accurate. And that's really all I'm looking for. Now if you stop and think about it, this is rather impressive, I think. Because we are now graphing functions that look rather complicated. This is a, this is a, uh, this is a cubic function with a coefficient of 2 on it and uh, I've been able to make a rough sketch. Now you notice the coefficient of 2 I said was going to stretch it a bit. That's going to make it go up a little, hot, little faster than I would have otherwise have drawn it. That's not something you can necessarily accurately portray in your graph, but just something that I can mention. So how would I have drawn it without the 2 there? I probably would have drawn just about the same shape, but technically it wouldn't have gone up quite as fast and it wouldn't have gone quite as low. It would have only gone down half as far as this one because this has been stretched to. And here, it would have gone only up only half as much as I drew it because of the two. But those things are all relative to my graph. OK, let's, uh, let's go to the next graphic and look at multiplicity. OK, now we have another example to sketch. Uh, this one looks even more complicated than the others, but it's actually no more difficult. This one says sketch the function u of x equals negative 2x squared uh, plus uh, excuse me, negative 2x squared times x minus 1 times x plus 2 cubed. Now you notice that x is a factor, but it's squared. x minus 1 is a factor, but it's given to the first power. And x plus 2 is a factor, but it's given to the third power. Those powers are called the multiplicity, because I actually have two factors of x. I have one factor of x minus 1, and I have two, uh, or three factors of x plus 2. So I would say that the multiplicity of x equals 0 is 2. That's one of my x-intercepts. x-intercepts, 0. This one, this one has multiplicity uh, 2. Another x-intercept is at 1. And it has multiplicity 1 because it comes from a factor that's given only to the first power. And then the last x-intercept is negative 2. And it has, it has multiplicity 3 because I actually have three factors of x plus 2. Now that has an effect on how I draw the graph. Let me just demonstrate this and then I'll show you the rule on the next graphic. Uh, when I go to graph this function, I'm going to locate my three intercepts. There's the intercept at 0, there's the intercept at 1, and there's the intercept at negative 2. So I've highlighted those. And I'm expecting this function to come in from below rather than to come down from above. And the reason is, if you look at the coefficient right here, the 2 is a stretch and the negative means it's been flipped over. So it's going to be coming in from below. Oh, and by the way, I'm expecting to see it go out below as well because if you were to multiply this out, I think you would get negative 2 uh, x to the 6th power. You would get an x to the 6th power and then a 5th power, a 4th power, a 3rd power on down. And uh, let, me, let me just write that up here. I think that's going to be negative 2x to the 6th and then some more. You see that even power tells me, tells me that, the, uh, that the end behavior is the same on both sides. So as this graph comes up, it approaches this intercept. And I'm going to have it level off and then turn and go back. Uh, go back, uh, oh, actually I'm looking at the wrong, I was looking at the negative 2. This is for 1. Let me back up here. I'm going to have it pass right through the 1. I'm going to have it pass, pass right through the 1 and then it turns and it comes back down. Now as I approach the 0, you notice 0 has multiplicity 2. You remember up here it was an x squared. And therefore, right here, it's going to look sort of like a parabola. It's going to turn and it's going to go back up. It doesn't actually cross. It just touches the x-axis. 
and I'm going to have it go up even higher than the branch before, and that's because I have an interval of two, not an interval of one, so I can wander further away before I come back down. Now, as I approach the negative two, uh, negative two comes from a factor with multiplicity three. So here, this is going to look sort of like a cubic function. It's going to turn, level off, turn, and go back down. So there are all these subtleties about what happens in the vicinity of an x-intercept. Right here, it's basically, shall we say, almost linear. It just passes right through. Uh, then at zero, it's almost a uh, parabola. It turns and goes back up. And then at negative two, it's almost cubic. It levels off, turns, and goes down. Now you notice both sides do go down like I expected. That's because this is a negative on an x to the sixth power. And this is my rough sketch of the function. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me, that was called the function u. So this is a rough sketch of u. I've certainly sacrificed a lot of accuracy. I don't know the graph goes that high or that high, but I do know it has this general shape, and that's all I'm looking for. It doesn't have to be a perfect likeness of it. Uh, let's go to the next graphic about multiplicity of roots. Um, it, this, this is a summary of what I've just mentioned in this, in this last example. When a factor has multiplicity one, the graph merely crosses the x-axis in an almost linear fashion. When you have multiplicity two on an x-intercept, the graph turns back like a parabola. It's rounded and it turns back up or it turns back down if it came in from below. And for multiplicity three, uh, the graph levels off and then it crosses the axis like a, like a cubic function. Uh, if we go back to the green screen here, I would like to graph the function that we were just looking at on the graphing calculator and verify that this is what the graph looks like. So let me just erase this. And I'll write out the function, once again, that we were looking at. That was u of x equals negative 2x squared times x uh, minus 1 times x plus 2 cubed. Now, we, we just made a rough sketch. Let's see what the graphing calculator tells me it's going to look like. So if we could zoom in on the graphing calculator. Um, I'll get it turned on here. And I'm going to go to the button y equals so that I can enter this function. And the function said negative 2 times x squared, open parentheses, um, x minus 1, close parentheses, times x plus 2. But that factor was cubed, so I have to enter a third power. I've had it, this has come back down on the next line. So uh, this is the function that I'm entering. Now to draw the graph, I have to pick a window. So I'll, I'll look to see what size window I want. Uh, for the minimum x, well, let's see. We know we want it to go from uh, negative 2 to plus 1. So let's say we're going to go from negative 3 to plus 3. I think that should be wide enough. And uh, for the scale, I think one unit scaling should be all right. That means on the x-axis, I'll see a little tick mark for every, for every one unit. For the minimum y, well, now I don't know how low it goes. Let's pick uh, negative 20. That may not be enough. We'll see. And for the maximum y, let's put positive 20. And for the y scale, let's go every five units we'll have a tick mark. OK, so here's the graph. Oh, well, now look what happened. There's, there is something different about this that I hadn't predicted. You notice it does come up from below, and it does go out, going down. It does cross the x-axis at 1, at 0, and at negative 2. Uh, this function does pass right through 1, almost in a linear fashion. It goes up to a peak, and right here it does turn, sort of like a parabola. It turns, and it goes back up. But look, it didn't go up as high there as it did over here. The reason is... Uh, I'm guessing it's because it had to come back and sort of level off over here at negative 3. So it couldn't wander too far off because it had to come back down, level off. So it's sort of like a cubic function before it turns down. So we actually get a higher peak here than we had there. Now you may say, Dennis, that means your graph was wrong. So what are we supposed to do? Well, what I'm actually suggesting is if you draw the graph as I just drew it, I would count that as being just fine because I think everything we drew made sense, but it wasn't totally accurate. But you remember, we're not looking for total accuracy. We're just looking for speed. So generally, we did have the right shape for this, for this graph. 
Okay, uh, now let's go to an application to sort of finish this discussion. And this will show you how people uh, use graphs of polynomial functions to solve problems. So let's go to the applications uh, graphic. Okay, in this problem it says an open box is formed from a 10 by 10 inch sheet of cardboard by cutting out squares from the corners and folding up the tabs. And then I asked several questions about this. Well, let's come back to the green screen and let me just illustrate what this problem is about and then we'll answer those questions. <coughs> so imagine that I have a sheet of cardboard that is, uh, we're sort of looking at it at an angle. It's sort of laying down here. Let, let me move that a little bit closer to the center so you can see it better. Um, so we have a sheet of cardboard and it's 10 by 10, 10 inches by 10 inches. Now what I'm going to do is cut a square out of each corner and I'm going to fold these little tabs up. You see there's a little tab that sticks out there, there's a tab on the bottom, there's a little tab there and a tab over here. I'm going to fold those up and when I fold them up it's going to look sort of like this. Uh, on the next side this folds up on the next side, this one folds up, and then on the back side, it's going to fold up. So you see, what I get here is an open top box. And the question is, what size tab should I cut out, one inch, two inch, three inch, whatever, so that this box has the maximum volume in it? So I'm looking for the maximum volume. Now, you know, if someone had asked me about this problem when I was a student, uh, in the beginning, in the early days when I was studying mathematics, I would have thought that would be impossible. How can you know what is the maximum volume inside that box? But actually I think we can do this and we can do it rather quickly. Here's how. Imagine that the little square that I cut out is X on each side. X and X all the way around. Well then how much is left over for the length of that tab that I folded up right here? 10 minus 2x. 10 minus 2x. There's 10 minus 2x. And you know, I think this is 10 minus 2x over here. And then, how tall will that box be? X. X. Because if this was x wide, then when I fold it up, it'll be x tall. So the volume of this box is going to be the length times the width times the height. And that's x times 10 minus 2x squared. You see, this is a polynomial function that represents the volume of that box. Now let's go back to the graphic and you'll see the first question that I asked in this application. If we go back to that graphic, said uh, express the, its volume, V, as a function of X, and that's what we've done here. Now in the second part, in part B, it says what is the domain of this function? So let's go back to the green screen. What's the domain of this function? Now, you see, normally for a polynomial function, you say that the domain is uh, all real numbers. But in this case, we know that x can't be negative. And also, x can't be bigger than 5. Because if x were bigger than 5, when I put an x on each end, I would have more than 10. And that's the total length of the cardboard. So it looks to me like the x's have to vary between 0 and 5. So this has a restricted domain, not because the function inherently has that domain, but because the application warrants it. Uh, now, when I go to draw this graph, uh, I would locate the x-intercepts. And the x-intercepts appear to be at zero and at, uh, what's the x-intercept there? What, what makes that zero? Five. Five, Five. Five. yeah. So I have two x-intercepts. I have an x-intercept at 0, and I have an x-intercept at 5. Now, when I multiply this out, I'm going to get a cubic function. In fact, let me just erase this so we can see it. And when I multiply it out, I believe, I'm running out of time, so I'll leave this for you to verify. I think you're going to get a 4x cubed. So that tells me this graph goes up on the right, because that's a positive. And I know not only does it go up on the right, it's going to turn like a parabola and go back up, because... 5 has multiplicity 2, so it's like a, like a parabola there. It's going to go up to a peak. Don't, don't ask me right now where the peak is. We're just drawing a rough sketch. And it's going to come down, and it's going to go through the origin, and it's going to keep on going because that had multiplicity 1. 
Now we said the domain was restricted, so I'm going to throw this portion of the graph away, and I'm going to throw this portion of the graph away, and what I have is my volume function, which goes up to a peak, comes down, but over on this side it levels off. Now you, you might guess that that peak is exactly in the middle, but it isn't. If I go to the graphing calculator, I'll just graph this here, and we'll see what we can learn about this function. So I'm going to go back to y equals. I'm going to enter x times 10 minus 2x close parentheses squared. There's my function. I'm going to choose my window to be, um, let's say we go from negative 1 to, whoops, let's see, excuse me, go to the window. Uh, let's say we go from, uh, from 0 to 5. And for the maximum, minimum y, let's say we go to 0, and let's say we go up to about 250. And for my y scale, let's say we're going to scale it every 50 units. Okay, here's the graph. This is like what I've drawn on the screen. You notice it levels off over here at 5, and it comes in at 0. So where is that peak? It looks like it's not in the middle, it's closer to 0. So if I go to trace, I'll just trace over, and I'm going to calculate roughly where that peak is. It's right about in here, and it looks like I'm getting somewhere up around 74, maybe 75. 74, 74, 73. I'm looking at this number. So it looks like the maximum volume is up around 74 cubic units. Uh, so I was able to get a rough sketch of the graph. I went to a graphing calculator to find out where that peak was. When you take calculus, you'll find out more about how to determine those peaks. Thank you very much, and I'll see you for the next episode.